that. And faith is released with the words of our mouths. That's right. Tumor, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. God taught me by the Holy Spirit how to start confessing the Word of God out loud and calling things that were not yet a reality in my life as if they already existed. I would be teaching on healing, and I'm going to show you from the Bible that God's will is your health. Jesus in hell itself was the first man to ever be born from death to life. One man said that if you took Adam and stood him up and God stood beside him, you couldn't even tell the difference between Adam and God. And I want to say to all you scribes, Pharisees, heresy hunters, all of you that are going around picking little bits of, of doctrinal error out of everybody's eyes and dividing the body of Christ and arguing over splinters and doctrinal hairs and, and dissipating and wasting all of our time when the world's going to hell, I say get out of God's way. Quit blocking God's bridges. Quit attacking man of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. You're God in heaven. I wish I can just prove it. They call out the ministry of my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. everyone. Welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long, and the man next to me needs no introduction. <laughs> but just in case you don't know who he is, next to me is Pastor Chris Rosebro. Pastor Rosebro is the pastor of, of Kongsvinger Lutheran Church in, uh, am I saying it right, Os Oslin, Minnesota? Oslin? You have to say it like this. You have to say it like Kongsvinger Lutheran Church. Kongsvinger Oslo, Lutheran Church. Oslo, Oslo, Minnesota. All right. There we go. Yeah, he is also the go. host. He's also the host of the Fighting for the Faith YouTube channel and the host for the Fighting for the Faith podcast. We are going to be talking about uh, a really important topic today. We're going to be talking, we're going to be answering the question, should we be calling out false teachers? Is that so? Because I can tell you, and I know you've experienced the same thing. I have had some people coming out of my comments and saying things like, well, you know, you guys are you guys are Pharisees or you guys are, you know, you, you, have you gone to this person in love before you actually, yeah. uh, you know, uh, try to rebuke this person publicly? Have you gone through all the biblical steps? So what, what do you say about that? So uh, what, what I would note then is, is that people who make these appeals, they, they are well-meaning. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they believe that they're following the scriptures, and unfortunately, they have been sold a bill of goods. And so as a result of it, they're firing at the wrong people, and they're actually disobeying God's word rather than obeying it. Wow. And so they've misappropriated particular texts, and they're misapplying them in the situation uh, that we see presenting itself in our time, you know, with the proliferation of false prophets galore and false signs, false wonders, false apostles. Pretty much, wow. you know, there's so much going on. But that, yeah, so over and again, this is, and they've been taught this. They've been taught this uh, in these charismatic churches, yes. which really do yes. not uh, emphasize the, the correct preaching and teaching and belief of what God's Word says and reveals. And so they, it's good that they believe that God's Word is God's Word. It's just that they're, they're misappropriating it. And as a result of it, uh, they're making some grave errors, which continue to endanger them. Because, mm -hmm. you know, here we are saying the building's on fire, and they're screaming at you going, how dare you say the building's yeah. on fire? I'm, yeah. I'm not in any danger. You yeah. know, and it's like, no, really, it's, it's really, it's worse than you can imagine. So, um, um, let's talk about some scriptural examples then of calling them out because the Bible, I, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was, uh, you know, preparing for this video is just how often the Bible refers to false teaching and false teachers. It's ama It amazed me. I mean, I, I, I just, I, there's, I have a little book here. Let me see if I can find in, in my Logos program here. It's called uh, Dictionary of Bible Themes. And so I just typed in false teachers and it just, phew, and then false prophets and false teaching. And it, it's just the scriptures is just 
They're just packed with this stuff. It's not like there's an isolated verse here or there, or maybe, you know, there's, 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 there's a verse in this uh, book or this book. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. Right. A good way to think about it is, um, so if we were just start with the New Testament, 27 books, 26 of them, 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament warn against false teachers. Wow. The only one that, the only one that doesn't is Philemon, all right, which wow. is a letter uh, returning a, a runaway slave. All right. So there's only one book in the New Testament that doesn't address them. And then when you look at the uh, you look at the Old Testament, uh, put aside the histories for a second. So uh, and you look at then the prophets. So so all the major prophets, the minor prophets, they're all dealing with either false teaching, idolatry or heretical practices or syncretism. If you were to think of the Old Testament prophets, they are kind of like the prosecuting attorneys of the Mosaic Covenant. Wow. And uh, and and so a huge swath of the prophets is all about returning people to the the covenant, to sound doctrine, to the scriptures, to abandon their idols. And so the best way you can think about it is, is that when somebody teaches false doctrine, they're going to be guilty of breaking at least two commandments and most likely more. But we're, we'll start with the commandment, you will have no other gods. And so what they're doing is, is that people who are teaching false doctrine are saying, I am going to believe on, in God on my terms or the God that I want to believe in. And so when they come up against biblical texts that contradict their beliefs, the, the word of God, take the scriptures describe them as taking God's word and like casting it behind their back. So, uh, and then the second one is, uh, is straight out blasphemy, taking God's name in vain or bringing it to emptiness. And the idea here is, is that they're ascribing to God things that God has not said by denying or undercutting mm-hmm. or making void what he has said. One of the most one of the most interesting accounts in all of scripture is the the reforms of uh, I think King Josiah. And uh, this is a fellow who was alive when Jeremiah was alive and uh, in his time, I kid you not, uh, they, they did the whole woke thing and, you know, gender bending and all oh that kind my. of stuff. And they had taken, you know, under his, I think it was his grandfather who did this, uh, Manasseh, he, he put to death anybody who contradicted his, his reforms going on in the temple. And he set up within the temple, Solomon's temple, he set up an Asherah pole, put it behind the Holy of Holies, uh, and, uh, and, and even had put up an image of a false goddess in behind the Holy of Holies with the idea that Yahweh needed a wife set up a starry host they set up set up incense altars uh, uh, to Baal inside the temple and uh, as a part of the temple complex they set up a religious brothel with male cult prostitutes all right so I just what consider just I want to know like the, which church council approved that yeah I mean seriously <laughs> you know, well, I make a motion that we put in a male cult prostitute <laughs> brothel, in our church, right? Wow. And so here's the thing. What was missing this entire time was the Bible because it was Josiah's grandfather who suppressed that and, and got mm-hmm. rid of it. Well, under Josiah's reign, what ended up happening is they, 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 the, the, the temple needed a little refurbishing, you know, some fresh paint and cleaning some things up and stuff like this. And so they took the money that they had saved up for this, and they started the refurbishing project. And what they ended up doing was they accidentally found a copy of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, and, and They brought it to Josiah. They brought it to Josiah and they read it to him. He'd never heard any of these words. And after he read them, he goes, we are in a lot of trouble <laughs> because we have broken all the words of this covenant. And they, they, so and that's what idolatry is. You take God's word, just toss it behind you and just do your own thing. And it's not like worship of Yahweh stopped in the temple. It's just that they added all this other stuff. Mm. Okay. So th- then you have in the in the scriptures the account of Josiah's reforms. He got rid of all of that stuff, and uh, and God, uh, you know, sent through a prophetess, you know, uh, basically a message to him that he wouldn't, uh, you know, that all the things that God threatened in the Mosaic Covenant and through the prophets, he wouldn't see that in his lifetime. It would end up happening in the time of his sons. So, but wow. uh, yeah, 
you know that it, that that this is how we go as human beings we we're we're sinful by nature and we we create idols all the time and we're not as christians immune to this we're or always threatened by people taking god's word undoing it and just making it void casting it behind them mixing it with error or their opinions and mm. uh, and so the Bible throughout, really throughout, warns us about this. Jesus, the first man to be born again from death, from sin to life, and it happened in the pit of hell. So I've also had people uh, talk about, you know, well, you know, just because so and so's associated with, uh, like, say, Francis Chan. Uh, for example, uh, he was associated okay. with Benny Hinn and some of these others, Mike Pickle and others. And I've had people comment and saying things like, well, just because he, he's associated, you can't you can't. This is just guilt by association. Right. So so let's talk about where the biblical line is. OK, so, for instance, I, I legitimately do not have a problem with somebody who is orthodox in their theology speaking to okay. people who are heterodox. That, that's not a problem. The question comes in that, uh, are you somehow endorsing their mm. heresy or strengthening the hand of the heretic through your appearance? And so when we talk about Francis Chan, it's not merely that he went to IHOP and spoke, it's that he is given a full-throated endorsement of Mike Bickle. Uh, look, Anyone that's going to be leading people into the presence of God 24-7 for 20 years, I just want to be around. And then when the Lord speaks to Mike and tells him about things, I, there's a trust I have in Mike um, because of his walk for the Lord, because of his reverence for the Word of God. I, I, I trust this man. As we fellowship, I go, he knows the Lord. Yep. It's not merely that he went to Bethel or, you know, he appeared on a Zoom call with Bill Johnson. It's that he gave his complete undying praise and support to Bill Johnson and to what's going on at Bethel. And so that you can't do that. So mm -hmm. if I were invited to uh, to speak at IHOP, I'd go. Yeah. They'd never invite me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah. so there's there's a big difference between going and speaking and then speaking out against what is false, and then just uh, kind of um, you know just right. going there and endorsing uh, a said false teacher. Right, and then I would note then the second John, um, the second John passage to John. Hang on a second. Here. Do you want me to share the screen here for you? Sure, that'd be great. All right, so here we All go. Right. Okay, so Second John is, you know, there's a warning to the elect lady there, uh, who is the lady whose house is being used as a church. This is before uh, Christians had, you know, church properties and things like this. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we, we, we were commanded by the Father. Now, don't let this pass you by, because when we talk about rebuking false teachers, you must understand that there's a positive aspect of it, and that is, is that we have a absolute positive command of Christ and of God the Father, that we are to walk and conduct mm. ourselves in the truth, not in lies. And so false teaching is necessarily a lie, and it blasphemes God, makes him say things he didn't say, and we're not to participate in that. So I ask you then, dear lady, not as though I were writing some new commandment, but that one we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is the command that we walk according to his commandments. Now, no, again, the possessive uh, uh, pronoun here, his we are to walk according to God's commandments, not man's. That's another positive thing that we consider in this case. And so the reminder then is against the false teachers. So he says that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. So many deceivers, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, not some 
many, and that continues today. And those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, these are the Gnostics, such a one is the deceiver and is the Antichrist. So watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And you're going to note here, there's there's the warning of the loss of eternal life mm. here. Uh, ending up in hell by listening to the deceivers. So everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. Note, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, which begs the question, where do I find that? Oh, I don't know, maybe the Bible? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. It's not that they're just mm. wrong or brothers. They don't even have God, all right? So whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, or di so here we got the didache in, in Greek. That could also be translated as doctrine. Does not bring this doctrine. Don't receive him into your house. That means don't allow him into your church or give him any greeting for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So when it says that uh, that not to let him in the house, that means don't give him a platform in your church because wow. this lady has a church at her house. So the best way I can put it is if a heterodox or heretical church invited me to speak, I'd go. But if they asked to come you know, to speak at Kongsvinger, I'd say not on your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so, so, so we know the Bible is filled with commandments to point out false teaching, but let me ask the next question now. Who can do that? Is it, so is it just for the layperson? Because um, there, you know, I have heard it said that, it, well, it's just mainly for pastors or for, you know, uh, church leaders. You know, I, I'm a I'm just a regular guy that has a YouTube channel that loves God's word and wants to warn people about false teaching. Is it OK for just for, for everyday Christians to point this out publicly, call out false teachers by name publicly? Yeah. And I'll give you a positive case for it. If you want, I'll share my screen yep. again. Yep, yep. Um, and in First John chapter 4, okay, note something here. First John is part of the New Testament, the section called the Catholic Epistles. And boy, we, we always freak out when we hear the word Catholic. Yeah. This means universal. This is written to Christians. So watch what the note here. You are the audience, and there is no distinction between the ordained and the layperson. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So you'll know, positively, it, it, this is a command for all of us. And then I would note that, uh, let me see if I can find this really quick here, Apollos, um, A-P-O, here we go. In the book of Acts, yeah, well, Paul passed through there, and he found that some disciples, let's see here. Yeah, I think it's Acts 18. In Acts 18, I'll, I'll show you this one, because this one comes up from time to time, uh, and I want my flex search. There we go. Uh, that, uh, that, that from time to time, you know, people ask, well, can women do this? I would note one of my greatest mentors was the late Gretchen Pazentino, who was a laywoman and a Christian apologist, extraordinary apologist, by the way. So let's see here. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, it says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was elo an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John the Baptist, okay? So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. <laughs> so... so <laughs> You know about that, uh, that Paulus, okay, the great uh, Christian apologist, uh, defender of the faith, he got schooled by a laywoman, okay? <laughs> husband. All and right. So I, I, I'm sure that uh, you you and I, you, is, and I started my, my time at fighting for the faith as, as a layman, you know? So I was trained in Christian apologetics, and I would note that the Christian church, its history is marked with not only pastors and bishops, uh, but also lay people who have done yeoman's work of defending the Christian faith. Uh, so in, in, the, uh, in the Book of Concord, 
Uh, you think of mm. the uh, the Apollo of the Augsburg Confession, written by Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon was, uh, was never go. a pastor. So, and his apology, the Augsburg Confession, is one of the most brilliant works of, uh, of theological apologetics written in the church's history. Mm. And his uh, and his defense of justification by grace through faith apart from works is it, like mandatory reading for everybody, regardless of whether you're a Lutheran or not. That that's that's one of the it's it's so well done. Yeah. So in scripture, yeah. ev- all of us are called to test to see whether or not what we're hearing is from God or not. Uh, in you have examples of people being corrected by lay people and women. Yes, women can actually correct men in this regard. And uh, and Christ himself in Matthew 7 warns the church, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. And that's not spoken to merely the, or the ordained. That is spoken to, you know, to all believers, regardless of their calling. You know, so, you know, th- that, there's your positive case that everybody can do this. That That's a really, really good answer. Thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate that. Um, so, Let's uh, let's talk for a minute, just just for a minute about uh, what a real Pharisee is, because one of the things that uh, I have uh, been helped by is a video that you and Steve Kozar did. Uh, I don't know how long ago was it a year ago now about who are the real Pharisees or something like that. It might have been like two. I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but one of the things is is that. Uh, I'm sure you've been called a Pharisee. We've been called a Pharisee. Oh, yeah. Fair, I mean, that's just Daily. every every single time you know we post a video, somebody calls us Pharisees. But so so one of the things that you make clear in that video, and I we don't have to go into too much detail. But one of the things that you make clear is it's not really people who are pointing out false doctrine that are Pharisees. It's actually the false right. teachers themselves who are the Pharisees. So um, can you can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So um, I, I, I'll reference it here, but we, we don't have to pull my screen up. In Mark chapter 7, you have Jesus uh, going toe-to-toe with the Pharisees. Uh, what they ended up doing was uh, sending a contingent from headquarters in Jerusalem to check out this Jesus fellow, mm-hmm. right? Now, here's what you need to know. The Pharisees nowhere show up anywhere, and I mean this, you will not find them from Book of Genesis all the way to Malachi, the Italian prophet, the last of the Italian. <laughs> wow, wow. So, yeah, but they're, they're not in the Old Testament at all. And they arose during what's called the intertestamental period. So in that 400-year silence from Malachi to John the Baptist, that's when the Pharisees arose. And they, ha- they had a narrative, okay? And the narrative went something like this, that when, when Moses ascended Mount Sinai, God gave him two Torahs. One was the written Torah. The other was the oral Torah. And at the time of Christ, the oral Torah was called the tradition of the elders. That's an actual title for this oral body of work. Now, it'll get later written down in the Talmuds. So if you if you read the Jerusalem Talmud or the Babylonian Talmud, parts of it are also found in the Mishnahs. But the whole point is, is that this oral Torah was where you got the command that if you went shopping out in the agora, uh, that you when you came in because the the the, the goyim and their those gentiles would get their uh, their spiritual ick on you, you had to do this washing ceremony. So if you remember that that Jesus he forbade his disciples from uh, but from doing that washing ceremony in Mark seven. So and so the Pharisees, they're seeing Jesus, you know, they're hearing him preach, they're hearing him teach, they're seeing him heal people and stuff like this. And where do they go to war with him? It's on the washing ceremony. Why? Because they basically said that if you do not obey both Torahs, you're not saved. And Jesus wouldn't recognize the authority wow. of their of their oral Torah. And so he forbade the disciples from doing this. And when they complained to Jesus, why do you not? Why do you forbid your uh, disciples from washing their hands and uh, and walking according to the tradition of the elders? And Jesus turns on him hard, and he said, "Oh man, did Isaiah prophesy against you, you hypocrites? You you worship me with your mouth, and you teach as doctrines the commandments of men, and you leave the word of God behind." This is you know Roseboro's paraphrase, but read it in Mark seven. The distinction there is is that the Pharisees were not representing biblical Judaism. 
everything that they had added to the scriptures, added to the body of, of, of work that they considered to be uh, you know, binding on people's consciences, they were actually, Jesus says, making void the word of God by their traditions. And so they were not people who were teachers in sound doctrine. They were as idolatrous mm -hmm. as Judah was in the time of Jeremiah, it's just that they got really sneaky in their idolatry. And so, you know, they added to the word this, you know, this tradition of the elders, and Jesus gave them not even a micron, you know, a micrometer uh, of, of, you know, 11, you know, of any kind of compromise. He, he held a hard line against them and basically said that uh, they, they had made void the word of God and that they weren't even of the truth at all. They had their own set of their own set mm -hmm. of rules that were added to scripture. One of the things I think, yep. I think you guys talked about in the video is that um, it, uh, it, it was actually, well, you just said it was added to the, what the, the Mishnah. Is it, what was yeah, it? So the Talmud, the so Talmud, the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds and parts of it are also found in the Mishnah. Okay. All right. And so, one of the things I do remember you saying, though, that it that it where it says tradition of the elders, it actually should be capitalized in the New Testament because it is an actual body of works that they were yep. referring to. It wasn't so it's yep. it's not tradition itself. It it is an actual body of works that these guys were referring to. So correct. And yeah, and what's interesting is is that uh, is that the others have made the connection between uh, Roman Catholicism and uh, the Pharisees, and I think this this sticks because Martin Luther talks about the fact that we got to get back to sola scriptura, and even you know, Rome they they have all these doctrines they believe in that cannot be found in the Bible, and uh, and so you ask a Roman Catholic, where do you get this idea of semper virgo? Where do you get this idea that we're to pray to saints? Where do you get this idea of purgatory? Where do you get these where do you get these notions answer tradition mm -hmm. it's it, and they and, and so their argument goes something like this well do, uh, isaiah prophesied for for many decades do you think that we have everything that he ever said that was from god yeah and go, no, no and say well and even john says that the, if that if they were to write everything down that uh, jesus had done he he he's thinks that they couldn't, all the books in the world couldn't contain it, right? And so they sit there and go, so some of these teachings, they just weren't recorded in the Bible, but they've come down to us through oral tradition. And yeah. you sit, and who, who called it the magic bag? You can just reach in there, you can pull any old doctrine out, you know? And, and, the, and I've heard the charismatics say, say that about prophecy too. Do, do you, don't you think that Jeremiah or some of these other prophets, or there were other prophets that prophesied that weren't written in scripture, don't you think that they themselves actually uh, said other prophecies or, or quote, you know, spoke other prophecies outside of the Bible? So, so how, how does that, you know, mean that, uh, you know, uh, prophecy is not for today? I've kind of heard that, that same kind of thing from, from charismatics as well. You know. Right. Yeah. And, and you'll note they're smuggling in other doctrines. OK, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so these charismatics for all their talk about, oh, well, we're not really adding to the word of God. Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, I, I, I think of that fellow who talks about we can go and file lawsuits in the courts of heaven, you know, and all that kind of whacker. Uh, right? is, what is that guy's name? I, I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, but here's Kevin Zadai. Uh, well, Kevin Zadai, he he claims that uh, that Jesus, you know, he recited one of the Psalms to himself while he was all by him, lo his lonesome, I suffering in hell. And he said, I had all these key verses that were coaching me into what I was supposed to be doing and who I was. And so Psalm 16, he said, was used when he was in the belly of the earth. And so he started to talk to me, he said, most people think, about the suffering that I did before I died on the cross. He said, I relinquished my communication with the Father for those days. He said, the only thing that I had was those Psalms that I had memorized. And he said, I rehearsed those and I kept telling myself that there was coming that point if I set the Lord always before me. And because he was at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And it talked about how he would be brought out, that he would not allow his body to see decay. His soul would not be left in hell. And um, he told me, he said, I rehearsed those things. He said, those demons were telling me that I had failed, that I had been left alone and my mission was a failure. He told me 
uh, Satan told me, he said, you should have taken the deal I gave you in the desert where I offer you to you all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you, you could have had them if you bowed down to me, but look at you now, you've lost everything. He said, I just kept rehearsing the word of God. And so he explained this to me. And as he was telling me this, he started to sob. You know. Right. They're, they're adding doctrines, okay? And what does John say? Anyone who does not abide in the teachings of Christ and goes on ahead, okay, they don't even have God. That's what the scriptures say. And then you think of, I would think of two epistles along these lines. So Peter, as he's getting towards the end of his life, and Paul, as he's getting towards the end of his life. So 2 Peter and 2 Timothy. And both of them, as like their parting shot, as they're getting ready to be martyred for the Christian faith in their, in their confession of Christ and him crucified for our sins and salvation in him only, both of them point their readers to the Bible. Okay. I know. So Paul does it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he even warns about a time coming in chapter 4 when people will not endure sound doctrine, but that they would, you know, gather to themselves teachers who would tell them what their itching ears want to hear. But in the chapter before that, he points them right to the scriptures that, and says that they are God breathed, they are noustos, you know, and, and, and that they are a light shining to our feet. That's what Peter says. Then in 2 Peter, all of 2 Peter is his warning, and he says, Put, pay attention to the word, all right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, both of them are, are talking in those terms that, you know, pointing us to the word of God. And uh, now the word of God, uh, it just gets honorable mention, you know, a few verses in and out of context here and there. Uh, but uh, we, we got to get on to the more important stuff of, of uh, following our man-made doctrines or worse, listening to the latest fresh word of the Lord. I feel that there's going to be a shaking and breakthrough coming, you know, and <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so, uh, <laughs> wow, man. Uh, so, okay. Um, can we look at some video clips and can you comment oh, on yeah. some of the stuff that we've got here? Okay. So. Before we do anything, I want you to listen to Benny Hinn here talking about uh, talking about his experience uh, with God, where God told him not uh, made Kenneth Copeland sick because he talked against Benny Hinn. So, and you can tell me, <laughs> and you can tell me, just just yell at me, stop, stop, because I can't hardly, I can't see. All I can see is my screen. So you'll have to say stop. All right. All right so so here we go. All right. I've seen many a man fall apart for touching preachers. Never touch them. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland got sick one day. I honor him for that. He got very sick one day. Ken Copeland got very sick one day. And so All right. I mean, okay. The question is, where did, can you show me on this doll where Kenneth Copeland touched you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! All right. Now, now, just just so you know, the the text they're taking out of context and is uh, is found in the Old Testament. In it's uh, there's a First Chronicles sixteen. Yeah, here it is. Do you want to go there? Right, so, sure. Let's let's take a look at that, All shall right, we? Let, let's go there. All right. So if you just, okay, so we're going to apply the three rules for sound biblical exegesis, which are on your t-shirt, context, context, and context, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at what's going on in First Chronicles 16, David is singing a song of thanks to God, and he's recounting the things that God has done to save Israel and acted in the in the lives of the patriarchs and things like this. So verse eight, oh, give thanks to Yahweh, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him praise, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works. So this kind of tells you what we're doing here, right here. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek Yahweh rejoice. Seek Yahweh in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, judgments he uttered. O offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is Yahweh our God. His judgments are in the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, 
which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. So you're going to note here, he's recalling the wonders and works of God by referencing what God did for Abraham, for Isaac, and for Jacob. So when you were few in number, okay, so talking about how little the, the tribe of Israel was, when you were few in number of little account and sojourners, all right, this is going back to the early parts of Genesis, uh, it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account. I think of you know, one particular king in, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Abimelech here mm -hmm. comes to mind, yeah. saying, Touch not my anointed ones, nor do my prophets no harm. This is not a command that says don't criticize a pastor. This is David's praise that God protected Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back in the early parts of Genesis. <laughs> so you know, I, I think you the idea. So, you know, it's just it's unbelievable, you know. So the touch not God's anointed tech. It, it. How does that go in the Princess Bride? I, I don't think that. I don't think that word means what you think it means. He didn't fall. Inconceivable. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. You know? No. Yes, so. I remember that. Yep. So let's move on. Let's just. Uh, and and we don't have to watch the whole thing. I think down here, this 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 is going to be the best this best one. But I just wanted you to just okay. hear what Benny here says. Benny Hen says. You spoke against Benny in Australia. Ken Copeland came to see me. He said, "Brother Benny, <laughs> I was in Australia and I was speaking privately to some preachers." And I attacked you. Please, I have to ask your forgiveness. I said, Ken, why would you do that? Why, 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 why would you ask my... He says, because if I don't ask your forgiveness, God will never forgive me. I honor him for that. He said, I got so <laughs> sick in Australia. Yeah. There's one unforgivable sin, and it's not speaking against Benny Hinn. The, the one unbelievable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So you'll note then that what we saw there was a reference, an allusion to a biblical text taken out of context, not focusing on what it actually means. And then Benny Hinn, let me just put it this way. He's a thespian. He's a man who's known for his theatrics. Mm -hmm. And he was channeling Catherine Kuhlman there. Yeah. And, uh, and and he was just about as creepy as she is. <laughs> oh, <was. laughs> uh, and, and, and this is, is, is to basically keep the people who are sending him the money in bondage, making them think that if they question or challenge or say anything against Benny Hinn, that, that God isn't going to forgive them. That's the whole point, is that he's telling the story so that anybody who thinks, oh boy, I better not look at my Bible and test to see whether or not Benny Hinn's really teaching me the truth because, you know, touch not God's anointed and God wasn't going to forgive Kenneth Copeland. He sure wouldn't forgive me. It's, it's, a, it's a way of entrapping. It, it's it's absolute manipulation and uh, manipulating his his followers. And one of the things that I've often heard is that if you do speak out, and you mentioned it just a minute ago, if you do speak out against these people, it is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and, and they say that's because what you're doing is you're contributing the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil. And um, yeah, you know, yeah, the problem is that uh, there's no evidence that any of this is from a work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, much evidence, a mountain of it, that that this is a different spirit altogether. It's either mm -hmm. human greed that's in operation, uh, delusion, or the devil. But it, it, you can rule the Holy Spirit straight out because this man contradicts and manipulates God's word and manipulates people, makes promises for God he hasn't made. And as a result of it, he breaks... The commandment, you shall have no other gods, and he also breaks the commandment of not taking God's name in vain. If, you know, in fact, if you were to look up blasphemy, I think Benny Hinn's, you know, his, yeah. his, his, his image is right there in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So let's move on to uh, Jim Baker. That's a, that's always a fun. Uh, that's always a fun guy to watch. So let's uh, let's head over no. here. When you're touching God's anointed, the thing Why is, it's. God said, do not touch mine anointed. But they feel and like I they have very... the right 
to discern who's be, God's and who's not God. I know. I'd be very, very careful. I don't know what part of judge not we don't get. He said, judge not that you'll be not judged. And it's a very freeing, freeing. Are we judging people, Chris? Are we judging these false teachers? Uh, yes. Yes. And, uh, and, we're not <laughs> and we're not contradicting scripture in doing that, just exactly. so you know. Hang on a second here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I've to search for, um, I want to flex search and I want to look in the gospels. Here we go. Hang on a second here. Uh, New Testament. Yeah, okay. Judge. All right. All right. So when Jesus says, a judge not lest you be judged, that's talking about hypocritical judging. Uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, is is guilty of the very thing that they're judging others uh, by. But you're, uh, we're instructed by Christ to actually make sound judgment. We are to judge. And uh, and that's exactly what testing you remember we're to mm -hmm. test the spirits they're there from God. So uh, Christ says in, in John 7, here's the text, John 7, that, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, I had it and then I lost it there. And I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> judge according to flesh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. Do not judge by mere appearances. 724. All right. So let me pull that context up. So, uh, so the crowd answered, "You have a demon who is who is uh, you you have a demon who is seeking to kill you." They accused Jesus of having a demon. Jesus said, "I did I, I did one work, and you all marvel at it." Moses gave you circumcision, not not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's body whole and well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Mm -hmm. That's actually in the red letters. And so you, when you look at the context of Matthew 7, that's talking about hypocritical judging. You know, the thing you're guilty of, you're judging others for doing, right? Uh, you know, that that's – and you think that somehow you're righteous because you point out, well, what, that guy's doing is sin, all right? Yeah, well, of course it's sin, you know, but you're doing the same thing. I'll give you an example of that. If you were, if you uh, saw the uh, the Hillsong documentary, uh, at, at, that uh, in the documentary it would it talked about how hard uh, Carl Lentz railed against uh, this one woman because her and her boyfriend had slept together. Now it was right that uh, you know that they committed sexual sin and the church shouldn't have approved of that. But the thing was, is that all the time while he's preaching against sexual sin, guess what he's doing? Mm. Okay, so so the Matthew seven, you know, judge not lest you be judged, is talking in that context. It's the person who's judging other people's sins who are engaging in the same sin, whereas Christ says. You know that we are to make a right judgment. We are to judge, and then you, when you look at all of the warnings against false teachers and the requirement to test which spirit is speaking and things like this, and test them against the Word of God, that requires you to judge. And it doesn't run afoul of of what Christ says: "Judge not, lest you be judged," because He's really talking about hypocritical judging in that passage. Well, let me ask you this: What about what Paul says in First Corinthians chapter five, where he says, um, "Are we not to judge those inside the church?" Would that fall under this same? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's right. He says, "What business do we have judging people outside of the church?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to judge. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and cast out the sinning brother. You know, it's like yeah. the one who refuses. Yeah, yeah so. I thought that would fall under there. I just wanted to to, to to clarify that. All right, let's uh let's continue. Judge not, but the warfare is going on. But don't be a part of it. Don't be a part of throwing fiery darts. There's the, the, that comes from Satan, not from God's people. That's how you know. How do we know they, that uh, they're saved? You know by love. But he said, by their fruits, ye shall know them. I preached on that the other day, if you were watching. And by their fruits, you should know whether they're a false uh, false uh, prophet or not, or a false teacher or not as yeah. well. And that right. fruit is doctrine. It's not... It's not the, um, you know, uh, whether or not they're living, trying to live a moral or godly life. It's the fact that their teaching is their fruits. And I think about Matthew chapter 7 and where Jesus is talking about uh, you'll recognize them by their fruits. Uh, uh, can, a, can a healthy tree bear bad fruit? And can a good tree or a bad tree bear healthy fruit? So all of that, I believe, is talking about doctrine. Am I correct on that? Yeah. 
That's correct. Now you'll note that in in the in the wider context of the entire New Testament, that when we are warned about false teachers, we're warned about their doctrines, but we're also warned about their uh, their aberrations morally, because false teachers. It, let, let's just put it this way, that in order to for a Christian to bear the fruit of the Spirit, mm-hmm. false doctrine can't produce it. Yeah. And so what yeah. you see in Scripture is this idea that the false teachers, they are wandering stars, so their doctrine moves. It's not anchored properly to the Scripture. But they also are obviously greedy, and they also have an eye kind of for sexual sin. Is the, kind of, mm. the two kind of go together, and they go from bad to worse. And this is what you should expect, because here's the deal. In order to mortify your sinful flesh, you need the Holy Spirit to do yeah. that. And and if you've like gone beyond Scripture and you're, you're teaching false doctrine, you've long abandoned the work of the Holy Spirit in making you holy. Mm. And good luck on mortifying your sinful flesh by yourself, buddy. That ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that, the, we don't need to go further with that. But let's, let's look at uh, – I put together a few clips – from the Word of Faith movement, or from the Word of, from the Word of Faith doctrine, uh, it talks about Christ. It talks about little gods, and so let's let's just take a look at that. and And the reason why I want to do that is just to uh, just to show how damaging this stuff actually is. This stuff is, yeah. I, it'll it'll literally send you to hell to believe this stuff. Okay, uh, and let's start with Jesse. All right, this is uh, Jesse Duplantis. In case people don't know who this is. See, you're going through the rigmarole of religiosity. God ain't interesting. You know, God never created Christianity. Man did that. God created Christ. God sowed Christ so he could have Christians. See, Jesus was a seed so we could be his family. Okay. So let's uh, let's talk about that little piece of... Uh, what on earth? Man, the guy has no fear of God. I'm telling None. you, it's scary, man. The the things that, wow. that these guys say, it's just unbelievable. So let's talk about that for just a minute. I mean, that is literally, you believe that stuff and it'll send you to hell. Jesus was created. Right. Jesus was a seed. So in the mind of God, God thought of Jesus. He you know, he, he, he thought of him and he, he produced him through uh, faith. You know, he had faith. So, you yeah. know. And this is where they t- end up twisting John 3.16 by only quoting half of it. And so they'll say, Jesus is a seed. How do I know? Because God so loved the world that he gave. So you need to give. This is how they, they talk. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the other half of this. I've heard these guys use, talk in the same way, but t- then ignoring the rest of the passage. John 3, 16 is not about tithing. Okay. But they, because they, they'll say Jesus is a seed. They say God so loved the world that he gave. See, he gave the seed offering of Jesus. So that man is one of the greediest, him and Copeland together are two of the, two of the most greediest oh, preachers I have oh, ever I, seen in my life. I honestly believe this. That the reason why Jesus hadn't come is because people are not giving the way God told them to give. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the fear of what are we going to do? I'm getting laid off at work. Hey, your job's not your source. Mm. If it is, you're in trouble. Jesus is your source. Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. And, and they're going to they're going to be a little shocked at how paltry their reward is. The oh, but don't you know Jesse went to heaven and the saw the apostle Paul there, and the apostle Paul said to Jesse, Jesse, are they preaching my gospel? Are they preaching my gospel down there? Walked, I saw a man with a Bible like this, a little short fellow, a Bible. It, it looked like a Bible. I don't a book. Anyway. Yes, yeah, books. And he was teaching about oh, I guess ten or twelve people, and. Um, I looked up like that, and he said, hello, Jesse. <laughs> and I said, hello. I said, who are you? And I, ladies and gentlemen, you, all I ask you to do is check the Holy Spirit. Why does I say this in your life? That's the only way I can tell you that. He said, I'm Paul. What are they saying about my gospel? He still called it his gospel. Whoa. And I told him that. I said, listen, I preach everything you say. <laughs> everything you say, I preach it. It's good stuff. I mean, just wonderful. <laughs> No, that he he really he really says that <laughs> his, on his trip to heaven. Um, but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. So, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. So let's now let's let's go to Copeland. And while I was laying there thinking about these things, the Spirit of God spoke to me. And he said, son, realize this. Now follow me in this. Don't let your tradition trip you up. He said, think this way. A twice born man whipped Satan in his own domain. And I threw my Bible straight up like that. I said, what? He said a born again man defeated Satan. The firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image and the very copy of that one. I said, goodness gracious sakes of life. And it just began, I began to see what had gone on in there. And I said, well, now you don't mean, you couldn't dare mean that I could have done the same thing. He said, oh, yeah, if you'd known that had the knowledge of the word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing. So. There you go, Chris. Um, if you had the knowledge that Jesus had, you could have you could have done the same thing that Jesus did. You could have whooped the devil in his own backyard, and you could have even atoned for, you know, sin. He couldn't even whip COVID. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> COVID nineteen. <laughs> oh I blow the God on you, oh dude. man, yeah. But but all of these guys they they all follow one another they all teach the same doctrine that all comes goes back to to Hagen and all of his mess but this is damning stuff this is stuff that oh, yeah. that will send you straight so, to hell for believing this stuff man so the belief the the doctrine that Jesus was born again in hell um, the, the origin of that actually happens to be hell because you won't find it anywhere in the scripture amen and. And, and so all of the, the whole soundbite that we heard, you know what was missing was an actual biblical text that said any of those things. Exactly. Uh, there, there was nothing there at all. Uh, so what he was doing there was engaging in adding to the scriptures, contrary to the express commands of scripture. So I, I'll give you an example. All right. So Jesus, when he's about to ascend into heaven, the gospel of Matthew chapter 28, uh, the, the text we're all familiar with, the Great Commission, right? So he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. All right. So we have an order from Christ that in his church, the only thing that's to be, to be taught is what he's commanded. That begs the question, where am I going to find that, right? I'm going to go with the Bible on this. So then you have the Apostle Paul as he's getting ready to die and be martyred for the Christian faith, saying to young Pastor Timothy, preach the word. Yeah. All right. So as yeah. a pastor, I have a call from God to preach the word. I don't get to preach my opinions. I don't get to preach my speculations. And if any time I speculate or give an opinion, I always highlight and say, this is my opinion, or I'm just speculating. You can take it or leave it. All right. I think this makes sense of this, but I could be wrong. All right. But what my job in the, in the pulpit is to preach the word. So listen to my sermons. It's like mostly Bible, all right? <laughs> yeah. Whole lots of scripture working my way through it and exegeting the text. What he didn't do there was actually exegete a text. He gave us Oh, well, the Lord told me, he revealed to me. No, he didn't. And the fact that you couldn't get rid of COVID-19, claiming that you have the same authority as Christ, proves you don't have it and God's not talking to you. And he still teaches that. I've got to, I'm not going to, I'm going to skip that clip that uh, shows him still teaching the same thing even today. That was in, when he was younger. But yeah, this, this is, this is bad. But wait, there's more. There's but wait, there's more. Yes, I've got uh, I've got one more clip I want to show you, and uh, this is recent. This is from uh, Bill Winston. As a matter of fact, one of my videos with Robin, uh, I showed this clip. Let me see if I can get to it really quickly here without. Yeah, there's Copeland, Copeland, Copeland. Winston is like one, one of the old guard, original Word of Faith guys, in one of the last standing. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll start it from here. So he said, and these shall all nations be 
blessed. And you go back over in Genesis, it says, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's what he says. Now, when we started yesterday, we talked about over in Genesis, how the blessing was conveyed on to Adam, Adam and Eve. And this blessing, we said, was the same power that God used to create the world. He created it with the power of this blessing. And then we said that... This is the part I want you to hear. There's a lot we could talk about there, but this this is the part, Chris, that I want you to hear here. Let me just back it up just a bit. And, and he's already off and the rails. And then we said... So. Say, say again. He's already off the rails. Oh, I big mean, time. This, yeah. All right. That now this blessing is on man. And mankind was made the exact duplicate of God. He was a replica of God. He was not spoken in the earth. He came out of God. Um, <clears throat> one man said that if you took Adam and stood him up and God stood b- beside him, you couldn't even tell the difference between Adam and God. Well, Chris... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I see the shock on your face. Yeah, uh, he, where did he get that from? You know, the book of Fourth Hezekiah. I, I mean, on Earth, and you know, and and how many people, Chris, are following these guys? I mean, like. I, countless numbers of people are following this stuff and believing this stuff. And I get messages all the time on Facebook or in emails. Hey, I used to be a part of the Word of Faith movement. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be interviewing a guy in May that was a former Word of Faith evangelist. So, uh, and he he uh, he ended up running into Justin Peters. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, personally, and uh, yeah, and so he's uh, he he actually uh, he actually came out and he's he's speaking out against this stuff. But uh, but yeah, the this, this people believe this stuff. One of the things he told me, he said, you know, when I was when I was I went to Rama because he went to Rama Bible Institute. He said, when I was there, he said, I began to hear this stuff because before I was a Christian, I was into new age and I was into the, uh, uh, some of the occult stuff. And he said, I practiced some Wicca and stuff like that. He said, so some of this stuff really sounded like that, that kind of thing that I used to be involved in. But this, this is what is called Christian by a lot of people. And one of the things that you and I, I, I mentioned to you, um, I think we were talking a couple of days ago, is the the fact that all of these people, and not just word of faith, prosperity, gospel pastors, and, and their, their followers, but th- so many are missing out on hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, yeah. that he bled and died for their sins. I am a, I'm a Christian, but I still need to hear it every single day because I sin every single day. And I'm so glad that when I go to church, I get to hear that, that Christ bled and died yeah. for me. I get the absolution spoke over me. I get to, to take partake of the Lord's Supper. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But so many people aren't hearing that, you know, they're going to church and they're hearing nothing but law. They're hearing, you know, um, you know, this false doctrine that's actually um, it's really just damning them and it's making their hearts hard and it's causing them to greed after to to lust after what these guys are saying. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, but yeah, but I would add to this also. The other bit is, is that th- these guys, this is make believe theology mm. and uh, and it doesn't work. So, I mean, from Kenneth Copeland not being able to blow away COVID-19 to the lady who sent in her $1,000 seed offering to Benny Hinn in showing God that she had faith so that she can be cured of cancer, and she's not. And so what ends up happening mm. is, is God's not, yeah. not, not responsible for, for basically supporting the false doctrine that these guys teach. And what happens to these people? They're getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And what creeps in is not faith. It's complete doubt and anxiety mm-hmm. and fear. The very things that undermine true Christian faith, because they haven't been 
pointed to Christ, nor have they been taught to teach, uh, taught to think the way Scripture thinks, causes us as Christians to think, and as a result of it, they they go into eternity without faith, despairing and fearing, and yeah. and as a result of it, they're lost. So you'll note that these false teachers they are the tools of the devil to take a lot to basically water down and deceive people and distract them away from the truth so that he can drag people off to hell. You mentioned the um, the Book of Concord earlier. When I first read the Book of Concord, one of the big things that I noticed as I was reading it from, and I read it from cover to cover. So one of the things I noticed when I was reading it was the concern that the Lutheran confessors had about the consciences of their people. Yeah. And they, it was just always about the conscience and, and always about their, you know, uh, consciences being burdened by their sins or burdened by, you know, uh, what they call what they would call enthusiasm, of, which would be false teaching and, and these other things. Yeah. But that 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 so many people you're right so many people go to church and they're burdened because not only are they hearing false teaching but some you know let's just not even talk we won't even talk about uh you know the the really bad guys like word of faith prosperity guys but just your average everyday persons that goes to church a lot of times they're just getting law seeker sensitive guys there is law 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 there's no gospel not not that i've seen not a lot of it anyway or like you used to talk about in your podcast, sometimes you might get a gospel flyover, but it, it yeah, won't. Or, yeah, just a speck, a little, mm -hmm. little, little, you know, a little, little bit of gospel sprinkled on top of that dog turd. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're but when I look at you know, and I know you'll agree with me. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We need to hear God's good news preached to us every single yep. Sunday. That's where, that's, we just need it. We need law and we need gospel. That's right. And, and we need the truth. We don't mm -hmm. need, we don't, and, and I'm, I'm willing to find this in scripture and scripture rightly handled. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's that admonition by Peter, uh, not, not by Peter, by Paul to, uh, you know, that uh, one is to study and show himself approved as a workman who need not blush with embarrassment, who can rightly handle or divide mm -hmm. the word of truth. Uh, and so when, when people are incapable of doing that, they, they, uh, they harm themselves. Even Paul, you know, his last parting shot to the uh, pastors of the church of Ephesus, Ephesus warned them that after his departure, that ferocious wolves would come in and uh, and that's all the way back in his time you know he he, he saw that you know the, that this this the threat of the devil in sending in agents to twist the scriptures up to tear Christ's sheep apart that uh, that the, the only way we are going to be protected by by God from them is through his word so and so that's so you mean false yeah, teaching ahead. was from the beginning of the church? It was it was there from the very beginning, from the it's <laughs> it's first you know, from the inception. That's what you're saying. Yeah, it was there. You know, as soon as the devil figured out, oh man, they, the Christ defeated me by dying and rising from the dead. He, he said, next best thing, I'll twist up the scripture so that people don't hear the good news. Mm -hmm. And and if you were to think about it, just look at it this way. In the New Testament, you have two really huge heresies that uh, uh, raise its ugly head at the time of the apostles. The first is the Judaizing heresy, this belief that uh, that Christians have to, in order to be saved, they have to add works of the Mosaic Covenant to their faith. So if you're not circumcised, you're not saved. If you're not keeping a the uh, the mosaic feast days you're not saved and so the council of jerusalem you can find this in acts chapter 15 very first church council put down the judaizing heresy mm -hmm. definitively mm -hmm. the apostle paul in galatians he he pronounces the strongest judgment that one can speak against a heretic he says even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one already preached let him be anathema let him be damned that's you know, basically what he says, and he says it twice. So, you know, you'll note the Apostle Paul, he refused to give even an inch to the Judaizers. So, you know, for the sake of the gospel, not being lost. So, yeah, and then the other heresy was the Gnostic heresy. Yep. Uh, so Gnosticism is definitively addressed 
by the Apostle John in 1 John. It's alluded to in 2 John, and then the 3 John deals with a guy who's uh, guilty of Balaam's, not Balaam's error, but uh, Korah's rebellion. That's a whole other issue. But uh, but John, he, he goes after it, makes it clear that the doctrines of uh, the Gnostics are the doctrines of Antichrist. He makes that very, very clear. They, they denied that Christ uh, even came in the flesh. And so, you know, because the flesh is evil, you know, it's mm -hmm. created by a, a demiurge who, who was having a temper tantrum or something like that. <laughs> Irenaeus, yeah, Irenaeus writes about it extensively in his book, Contra Heresies. So, yeah, but uh, and then it, it, then uh, if you uh, read uh, Irenaeus, he talks about Serinthus. Uh, in in Ephesus, uh, the Apostle John goes to Ephesus. Uh, it brings Mary, uh, the the mother of Christ, with him. By the way, she she dies there, and um, it's it, he went into a bathhouse. Uh, the the way the story goes, and uh, and he saw the the arch heretic Serinthus, who was a Gnostic, in the bathhouse, and he fled. He, he without even bathing, he fled at the building. And, let's fly, lest the whole building fall in, because Serinthus, the enemy of, of of Christ, is in the is in the building. I mean, this the, the, you look at how the the the, the apostles themselves mm -hmm. dealt with her and heretics. They they gave them no respect they gave them they they refused to compromise with them even one inch and they stuck to their biblical guns the whole time yeah and and they yeah and, and they 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 called them out by name they called t false teachers out by name they didn't tiptoe around them and say well you know let me just see if this is uh if we're being judgmental or not here they they made no bones about it paul the apostle paul wow. called teachers out by name g uh 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 we I, we were talking about the uh, the church fathers, the apostle John and Serenthus, and then you had uh, uh, what, even like one story I, we were talking about earlier, Polycarp, even uh, running into yeah. Marcion, and what did Marcion say to yeah. him? I got it down here. Um, Marcion yeah, said, "Do you, you know gotta, me?" He yeah. says, "Yeah, I know you. You're the firstborn of Satan." <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, let me share the screen. So me, you got something there? Yeah, I, I I even have one a little stronger than this. Galatians Ooh. chapter two. Uh, in Galatians chapter two, this is what Paul says. He says, but when Cephas, that's Peter, Peter, the apostle Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned before certain men came from James. He was eating with the Gentiles. Peter had bacon breath, right? Uh, but when they... <laughs> But when they came, he drew back and he separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them, so that even Barnabas was led astray by, by their hypocrisy. So Paul names Peter, he names Barnabas. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth, I said to Cephas in front of them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? It, you'll, you'll note that Peter... Uh, he he made a theological blunder, and it, it it showed up in his actions, and he got called out by name. Ooh, by yeah, yeah. So, so it is it is uh, it is right. It is biblical. We should call out these people by their names, and we should we oh, should yeah. point out false doctrine. That should be something that that uh, it shouldn't be even questioned, but it is questioned all the time. People are always, you know, and, and it, it's probably from so, what, what, like you said in the beginning, it's what they've been taught. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And they trust that what they've been taught is true, but they, they haven't actually fact checked. They, they, they're not reading the Bible for themselves. I, I think I can give you one more okay. example of a guy being called out by me. All right. Uh, third John, this is one of the funniest instances in all of scripture. Uh, you know, I I think this is just a scream. Uh, so uh, here's what it says in Third John verse nine. I I have written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Here you have a fellow named in this epistle, by the way, forever in all of God's word. <laughs> Uh, name is, he opposes the apostle John and watch, he says, so, so if I come, I'll bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us and not content with that. He refuses to welcome the brothers and stops those who wants to and puts them out of the church. Who is this guy? I mean, you, you, so you're going to note false teachers, they oppose the truth and those who bring it. Hmm. And here John names Diotrephus by name and says he's going to have a little conversation with him. 
Hey, so, do me a favor, yeah. Chris. Go to the top sure. there of your of, of your Bible. There, um, what what is the yeah. first verse of that? Uh, at the very it, 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 third John. What is the first the first verse in the entire epistle? Epistle. Okay. All so, right. So third John, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. John third John one is that what you're asking? Third about? John two. There. It, it's ironic that the prophecy uh, that the uh, that the the uh, guys who who promote uh, the. Um, yeah, the, the 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 word of faith heresy loved this verse right here, especially in the oh, King yeah. James. And it's ironic to me that this is talking about somebody who is a uh, you know that's being pointed out as a as a false teacher. Yeah, yeah. So watch this. So beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, that uh, that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. See, that God wants you to have good health. He wants you to be prosperous and all this kind of stuff. See, it's right there. Uh, the thing is, is that that's just the standard way yeah. of opening a letter, you know, back in the day. It, yeah. He's not saying, that, yeah. you know, you, you get the idea. I get the idea. I just thought it was pretty ironic that they use that verse to uh, promote their doctrine and the whole epistle is not even talking about that. It's good stuff. Yeah. And, and poor Diocletus, he gets named forever in the word of God. <laughs> Chris, he thank you. Poses. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on and talking about this stuff with me. It, it's it's going to be really, really helpful. I'm so glad you took time out. And you're a busy man. You pastor two churches, is that right? Yeah. Um, so I, I pastor two congregations in Minnesota, and uh, in the one's in Radium and the other's in Oslo. And and I do a lot of uh, work, you know, uh, catechizing, teaching, and, and preaching the word to people via the internet as well. So. Uh, yeah, very busy is is a good way to put it. So. And so, thank you very much for taking time and and coming on uh, coming on the program today. I really greatly appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Oh yeah, yeah. And and we will uh, continue to promote you here on and uh, fighting on you know fighting for the faith on our YouTube channel. We've got you right up there on the front page, and we'll continue to promote you and promote your work. Thank you so much for all that you do, brother. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Thanks for watching, folks.